Hey there, this is Melissa Delamora. I'm a nurse practitioner here with Nevada Advanced Pain Specialists and Dr. Dennis Patterson, our practice owner. I've worked with him for quite some time now. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing good. So today, um, I, we're just gonna ask you a few questions about pain pumps and just chat a little bit about um, some details about them. What kind of uh, diagnoses would go along with offering a patient a pain pump? It could be basically any diagnosis. You're just looking for a patient who has a chronic pain condition that hasn't resolved with any treatment over time. Um, you know, and, and specifically, you know, when you talk about, you know, what kind of specific treatments are you referencing, I, I, would, I would tell you, you know, I always kind of break down treating chronic pain into five categories. And one would be modalities. And we're talking about simple things like IC TENS units to kind of address their pain. Um, you know, usually that's not, that's a, that's a passive treatment. A lot of patients don't get better from that. Um, uh, it just usually makes them feel good temporarily. Second thing would be medications, right? <clears throat> um, and medications a lot of times don't treat the underlying pathophysiology of the reason why the patient is left with their chronic pain condition. It, 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 once again, it's kind of a passive treatment that usually just makes them feel good. Um, and, and usually, you know, I try to use these modalities and medications to get patients more involved in active treatments. And that's the next three buckets. You know, those would be therapies, and by therapies I mean, you know, could it be physical therapy, chiropractic care, acupuncture, occupational therapy, um, uh, or, or even behavioral health. You know, those things can kind of address patients' pain and, and, and improve it long, long term. And then, you know, a lot of times we try simple procedures, injections, you know, depending on the pain issue, that depends on what type of injection they do. And then a lot of patients who've tried and failed everything, they end up getting some type of surgical intervention from one of our surgical colleagues in town. And, and I think, you know, unfortunately, there is a small percentage of patients that just don't get better with any of those treatments. And, and so I think those are excellent candidates to then look for doing a pain pump. And usually, you know, the goal of the pain pump would be to get them off oral medications because a lot of times those medications that they've gotten stuck on chronically through going through all those treatments, those medications, you know, can start to cause side effects or problems long term. So I don't think there's, there's really one or a few diagnoses. I think it's any chronic pain condition that a patient suffers from, whether it's mechanical or neuropathic in nature. Um, and, and, and those patients who are especially on chronic medications that are causing them long-term side effects or problems for their livers or, or, and kidney, I think those are excellent patients to be put on a pain pump. Okay, so with that patient um, who comes to you, what are some of the things that they may complain about when they see you that makes you think this might be a good patient for a pain pump? Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking it's more wide kind of spread pain. You know, a, a lot of times um, if patients have more focal pain, then I'm thinking that, you know, there may be some type of interventions that probably hasn't been done before, like a radiofrequency ablation, or maybe some type of stimulator, especially if the pain's neuropathic that I can do. But when a patient comes in and they've said, well, God, doc, you know, I've got neck pain because I've had a neck surgery. I've, had, I've got a torn rotator cuff, so I've got shoulder pain. Uh, I've got severe arthritis in a right hip that's bothering me. You know, they've got, you know, multiple things that are causing pain. And I think those are a patient that could benefit from being on a, on a pump. Um, uh, because the, you know, the, the great part about the pain pump is, is it just doesn't address, you know, one area or one area thing. It can address the overall condition of the patient. Okay, so when a patient, we've got the patient selection, we think they'd be appropriate. Um, describe the procedure. How does, how does the procedure actually take place? The great part about a pain pump is it's a two-step process. And, and that's why I like it is you can try it before you buy it is kind of the, the, the saying I always tell patients. And so what happens is they'll, they'll you know, the first, the first step is a trial. And that means they'll come to the office and we'll inject the medication that would be put in the pump into their, what's called the intrathecal space. The intrathecal space is a uh, potential pace in the spine that has the cerebral spinal fluid. And so in theory, the cerebral spinal fluid um, uh, can go anywhere from their brain all the way down to the tip of their spinal cord. Um, and so a lot of times the patients will come in, we'll place a needle into that intrathecal space and, and we'll do a, a short uh, burst or injection of the uh, pain medication into that space and see how the patient responds. 
Prior to that appointment, we usually set them up with our physical therapist because we want to see if they get functional improvement as well as pain improvement. And so usually they'll see Jamie or Kelsey, you know, a few days before and they'll kind of put them through a, uh, a series of uh, physical activities and see how they do. They come to me, you know, a couple days later, I do that injection I just described. And then I usually um, will set them up to see the physical therapist a couple hours later. And two things I'm looking for, you know, um, after they go through the physical therapy, I'm asking them, you know, before the procedure, what was their pain level on a scale out of 10? And then I'm asking them after they finish the physical therapy, what their pain level is then. And well, basically insurance is looking for a 50% reduction in pain. So say the patient comes in that day, they tell me before I did the injection, their pain was an eight, and after they finished physical therapy, it was a two. By that, they're definitely a candidate to move forward with the pain pump, uh, the permanent implantation of one. Uh, the other thing I, we're looking for is then when, uh, after they're done working with, out with the physical therapist, I'll either talk to Jimmy or Kelsey, who they saw, and say, hey, how did the patient do? And uh, they'll be like, you know, gal, it was unbelievable. You know, a couple days ago they really struggled getting through this these exercise program, and today they, they flew through it no problem. Um, so there's definitely a functional improvement. And so when I see pain relief and I see functional improvement, then then I'm, you know, I think a patient should move forward with a permanent implant. And and that procedure can't be done in the office. Obviously, it's a it's a minimally invasive surgical procedure. It has to be done at the the surgery center or the hospital. Uh, but essentially the, the patient will show up at the hospital, it's probably about a three hour um, a process, you know, an hour to get checked in, about an hour in the operating room, and then an hour of recovery afterwards. <clears throat> but at the hospital, the, the, the process from start to finish would be that they would, they would get taken back into the operating room. Um, you know, we get them comfortable laying on their, their stomach. And then I'll kind of um, um, uh, kind of pre-plan where I'm going to make my incision to get the catheter in that I'm going to put into the intrathecal space. And then um, usually in the left or right flank, whatever the patient prefers, I usually put the pump there and I'll kind of plan on where I'm going to make that incision as well. Uh, at that point, we'll clean the skin, uh, cover the patient up with sterile drapes, and then we will we'll make the incisions. And through the first incision, I'll put a needle down into the intrathecal space. I'll slide the catheter to the level of interest to give the patient the most pain relief. And um, once I get the catheter in the right place, I'll remove the needle. Then I'll tunnel the catheter over to where my second incision is, where I'm going to put the pump. And I'll connect the catheter to the pump, implant the, the pump, uh, use sutures to close the incisions, and staples to close the skin. Great part about the procedure is I'm not removing any body parts. You know, I'm, I'm actually just hiding uh, the system within their soft tissues. And so the patient has very little pain afterwards. Um, plus, you know, the pump has got the medication in it. And, and, and so we turn that on a few days after the procedure to also help with their post-operative pain. Uh, but the patient is seen usually, you know, like I was saying, uh, two to three days after the implantation, we turn the pump on. And, and then we uh, see them 10 to 14 days later to adjust the pump, remove their staples. And then they're seen every one to two weeks until the pump is adjusted to the point that gives them the most maximum uh, pain relief and uh, uh, function. When you are um, talking to them and explaining the procedure, what kind of complications would they need to worry about? What would you what would you discuss with them? Typical complications for the procedures. Anytime you, you, you know, you make an incision in the skin, you're, the first one you're worried about is infection. Uh, statistically, infection is very low. It's about one, uh, less than one or two percent. Um, knock on wood, in my 10-year uh, career, I've never had an infected pump. I'm not um, uh, perfect, so I've had those in other procedures, so it it's, it's potentially could happen. Um, typically, that, that type of, uh, if it's a soft tissue in, infection where the incision site was made, typically that goes away with just treating the patient for a week or two of antibiotics and, and monitoring it. Um, if that infection did get deep and it did infect the catheter or the pump, then the whole system would have to come back, uh, come out, let them heal, um, usually with antibiotics after that, and then discuss re-putting the, the pump in after they heal, uh, you know, a couple months later. Other, other potential side effects could be bleeding, you know, anytime you cut open the skin, there uh, could be bleeding. I've had, you know, probably uh, uh, one hematoma in the area where I put the, the pump. Uh, but just pressure over that, that goes away. Really nothing to, to, to address. It's just a, um, a reassurance to the patient and let them know that that's normal and, and it will resolve. 
And a lot of times to try to prevent a hematoma, um, we'll, we'll have the patient post-operatively wear a uh, brace, and that brace is more or less just to hold pressure to prevent any, any, any bleeding into the area of the, of the pop, pocket of the pump. The last thing is, is you, you worry about, um, you know, when you put the needle into the intrathecal space, you know, you don't want to poke the spinal cord or anything like that. That could cause neurological damage. And, uh, knock on wood, I've, I've never seen that issue or, or had that problem. Um, but also, you know, you don't want any bleeding within the spinal canal because that could, could cause paralysis as well too, and I've, I've never seen that either. What would you say to a patient when they ask you about how much relief? What kind of expectations should you talk to your patients about? Oh, I, I always let patients know that uh, this procedure is not a cure. And it's just like the trial. We're looking for a 50% reduction in pain. And so I, I realistically let them know that that's our goal. What release they got during the trial, that's our goal with the permanent implant. You know, our goal of the pain pump is to get the patient off the oral meds. And so I think there's a lot of work up front. You know, the patients have been used to be on these meds for an extended period of time. And to them, it's a scary thought of getting off of it. And so we work with the patient and we try to help them, you know, get to the lowest possible dose before we put the pump in. And then after the pump is in, we stop them all, uh, all the oral meds at that point. It's not a perfect process and we're not gonna put the pump in, turn it on, and they're gonna get immediate pain relief. It takes a period of time of weaning, you know, weaning the pump up. Um, and so when we see the patient every one to two weeks initially, and it could take you know, a, a good two months before we find the right dose that helps the patient out. Um, and so I think that's the other thing the patient needs to know is that there's patience at the beginning. You're gonna come in every week, one to two weeks, but once we get you on the right dose, at that point, you're not on oral meds, and all you need to do is see us to fill the pump. And that's usually every two to three months. And so I think that kind of gives the patient a little bit more freedom. They're not as tied down to the medical um, industry as they were before the pump. Great, thank you so much for talking to us about pain pumps today.